Tom Patterson was on life support. His wife, Stephanie Strathy, was told there were no treatments left. His body was overrun by a drug-resistant superbug, but Stephanie wouldn't give up hope. It all started during a vacation in Egypt in 2015 when Tom got violently ill. They thought it was just food poisoning. I was vomiting for hours. It was just uncontrollable. Steph was insistent and called a doctor and, and said, oh, you're going to be fine by tomorrow. Well, I wasn't fine. I thought we have antibiotics for this, right? Whatever it is, modern medicine can handle it. But no, no. Um, it turned out that it was the worst bacteria on the planet. Tom was infected with Acinetobacter baumeniae, a nightmare pathogen that over time has evolved to outsmart medical treatments. This organism is something of a bacterial kleptomaniac. It's really good at stealing antibiotic resistance genes from other bacteria. And when we're throwing antibiotics at somebody to try to cure them, it kills everything but this little guy. And then it just multiplies and moves in for the kill. Stephanie had seen this bacteria before as a student at the University of Toronto. This Canadian is now a renowned epidemiologist specializing in infectious diseases, even named one of Time Magazine's 50 most influential people in healthcare in 2018. I was hallucinating so much that I was losing touch with reality. Every single cell in my body, every hair was pure pain. I'm not a medical doctor, so I was trying to learn on the go and realized that, you know, the chances of him dying were getting close to 95%. And yet I still thought, well, like there's got to be some antibiotics that will kill this thing, right? But then Tom was medevaced back to our home in San Diego. And by then it was only a couple of weeks later, but now it was resistant to all antibiotics. This nightmare bug is one of many microorganisms that has become increasingly resistant against treatments used to cure infections, including antibiotics. Known as antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, it's caused in part by the misuse of antibiotics in healthcare and in livestock. For Tom, it meant he was out of options. The doctors, nurses, people would come in and they would say, it's futile, he's going to die. And I heard that. The doctors had a meeting with me and they said, look, you know, your husband is not getting any better. He is now in a coma. And they asked me the quintessential question, do you want to keep your husband alive? And that was the most terrifying moment of my life. It was an impossible decision. Stephanie didn't know what to do. She turned to Tom for the answer. I remember reading a scientific paper that said one of the last senses to go in a dying person is their hearing. And so I asked him, honey, the doctors are doing everything that they can, but they don't have anything left to fight this thing. So if you want to live, I will leave no stone unturned. Don't assume that people don't hear you when you're in a coma. Stephanie asked me if I wanted to give up. She said she loved me and then I heard her say, if you want me to try to help you, squeeze my hand. And I waited, and he squeezed my hand. I mean, I was ecstatic. And then I thought, oh, crap, like, what am I going to do? At the University Health Network in Toronto, we met with Dr. Susie Hoda, who, even in the middle of the pandemic, is concerned about AMR. As the medical director of infection prevention and control, she's alarmed by the lack of attention given to the crisis, even though the WHO declared it a global health threat. It's interesting because in this pandemic, different countries have experienced surges that are of different magnitudes, have happened at different times, have been dealt with in different ways in the, by their healthcare system. And all of that affects their risk of antimicrobial resistance. And I have no idea how they've managed their risks. We're not talking about that right now because we're focusing at the pro on the problem at hand. Let's begin with the facts. By 2050, it's projected 10 million people will die every year from drug-resistant infections, but experts say that figure is dated and in reality is far worse because of the pandemic. 
One reason for this is the misuse of antibiotics to fight the coronavirus. Research from the Americas showed more than 90% of patients admitted to hospital for COVID were prescribed an antimicrobial, but only 7% needed them. There are a number of things that have happened through this pandemic that I think do affect a risk of antimicrobial resistance increasing. And certainly there have been a couple of studies that have come out more recently that have shown that healthcare acquired infections, but also antibiotic resistant organisms in hospital settings have been on the rise through this pandemic. Dr. Hoda points to resources being reallocated from surveillance and prevention to deal with the immediate emergency. Facilities in the U.S. and Europe have reported increased cases of superbugs among patients hospitalized with COVID, according to the CDC. I'm not sure we'll truly ever really know exactly how much of a degree the pandemic has played in what ends up transpiring, but it will be years before we feel effects. It's very much a snowballing issue, so if we don't address it now, it just continues to perpetuate and get worse and worse and worse. Back in Southern California, Tom was in a coma. His organs were shutting down and Stephanie was scrambling to find a way to keep him alive. No antibiotics would work. It led her to search for a potential cure. And what she found was bacteriophage, a century old therapy. Bacteriophage or phage for short, are parasites of bacteria. They're viruses. They're a hundred times smaller than bacteria and they have evolved to be the perfect predator of bacteria. They were actually discovered by a French Canadian, Félix Dejarel, a self-taught microbiologist, and he was the first person to use phage therapy on people. But when penicillin came on the scene around the time of World War II, it was a miracle drug. And so the West forgot all about phage therapy. This is how it works. Phages, which kind of look like alien spiders, need a host to survive but they're picky. Each phage has its own preference and will only hunt a particular type of bacteria or those in the same family to gobble up and kill. There's an estimated 10 million trillion trillion phages on the planet. They're everywhere. They're in our bodies, they're in soil and water, but you need the right kind of phage to kill the bacteria that you wanna kill. So it's kind of like a lock and key. Since there are more phages on Earth than bacteria, finding the right match in time for Tom wasn't going to be easy. Stephanie reached out to phage researchers for help. Now this is the wild part. They sourced them directly from places like sewage, barnyard waste, because wherever you find a lot of bacteria, you find the perfect predator, the phage, that will kill them. Okay, here we are, we're having Megan administer phage therapy intravenous to Dr. Tom Patterson. Three weeks later, they had two phage cocktails purified to give Tom. And we injected these a billion phages, one billion phages per dose. Even though one of the doctors described this as like a Hail Mary pass, Tom woke up a couple of days later, lifted his head off the pillow and kissed his daughter's hand. Good morning. What what is it that you like today? Oh, a nice hamburger would be good. A hamburger. We'll see what we can do about that. Very good. Waking up ain't like in the movies when you've been in a coma for three months. It's a slow process. Your brain comes online very, very slowly. I just remember waking up and there was my daughter. One, two, three, up. Right on. I prayed and uh, we were lucky. And in fact, we've gone on to use this treatment to save other lives and limbs. It's been more than five years since phage therapy saved Tom's life. And during those years, Stephanie and Tom have turned their anguish into action, helping those in a similar state. Well, you know, we're going to this canyon where there's some sewage runoff from the neighborhood. On the day we met with Stephanie and Tom, they took us to a wooded area to search for phage. We like to crawl around these places because, you know, medicine comes from strange sources these days. What Tom and I often do is we try to collect uh, samples, um, sludgy water, sewage, um, you know, animal scat. In fact, there's some skunk scat right in our backyard. I should probably put that in a container and take it off to the lab. So I got gloves. I got my trusty trowel. They don't get too far down the trail when they find a good spot. 
So this little footbridge here, there's a little creek. You can see there's some nice gummy water over here. Okay. Well, you're caught. Well, you're not supposed to fish for weeds. <laughs> well, you know, along with that rock, we have some sewage runoff and a couple of leaves. There's phage everywhere, right? So the leaves can't hurt. I mean, just a drop of water can have a trillion phages in it. We're just gonna continue to collect some and pour it into here. Very sophisticated science experiments. Once the samples are collected, Stephanie takes us inside the lab at the University of California, San Diego, where the phages will be isolated. It's here Stephanie launched and co-directs the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, the first dedicated phage therapy center in North America. She shows her latest find to the lab director. Pretty fresh scat from last week. I figured, you know, that skunk thought he was so smart pooping on my lawn. I thought, you know, I'm going to get you. I'm going to turn you into medicine. Oh, my, my, my. Jokes aside, while the world is focused on the pandemic, Stephanie is determined to continue the fight against these insidious monsters that are silently spreading, because samples like this might be the only viable alternative in a crisis where many modern medicines no longer work. We've only started to turn our eyes back to phage therapy because of this superbug crisis. And now there's clinical trials being done. There's a network of uh, phage researchers and infectious disease physicians across Canada that are trying to get it going there, and I'm trying to help. This is being upheld as the potential answer to the superbug crisis. In the midst of a, a pandemic, it's hard to get people's attention for yet another problem. They want to go on with their lives. They don't want to hear about another problem. but. This is a problem that's here. And actually, I'm the poster boy. I'm the experimental guinea pig, if you will. But Steph is the woman who really came up with the idea and continues to be in the vanguard advocating for it. And I can't tell you how much I love her and appreciated that.